Hi, I'm Zan Fishman, and I am the Director of Energy Policy and Carbon Management here at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Our energy program at the Bipartisan Policy Center focuses on designing and advancing evidence-based, effective federal policies to responsibly drive a transition toward a net zero economy that promotes economic growth and American competitiveness and ensures that American families and businesses have access to affordable, reliable energy. I'm particularly excited about today's event because we have some great speakers and we're going to be talking about a new emerging climate policy solution that is getting attention on both sides of the aisle, linking climate policy with trade policy. The idea that we should think about the carbon intensity of imports and exports is not new in and of itself. Various border carbon adjustment mechanisms have been proposed over the years as part of both carbon tax and cap and trade legislation. The theory has been simple. We should make sure our domestic climate policy doesn't disadvantage our exports or create an advantage for imports. In fact, a recurring argument that some have made against domestic climate policies in general is that if they're poorly designed, they could hurt domestic manufacturing and boost manufacturing in countries that emit more CO2 which could result in an overall increase in global greenhouse gas emissions. But over the past year, a new idea has emerged that's starting to gain steam. What if we enact a border carbon adjustment mechanism even without having a price on carbon? I've heard one Republican refer to this as a carbon tax on China. Early versions of the Build Back Better legislation included a border carbon fee, which was dubbed a carbon polluter import fee. And last summer, two Democrats, Senator Chris Coons and Congressman Scott Peters, introduced the Fair Transition and Competition Act, which would create a border carbon adjustment mechanism. And more recently, two prominent Republicans, Senator Kevin Kramer and former National Security Advisor General H.R. McMaster, who we had the opportunity to hear from today, published an op-ed in Foreign Policy titled, Use Climate and Trade Policy to Counter Putin's Playbook, where they make the geopolitical case for why this would be in our interest. Much of this is, uh, is based on a report uh, published recently by the Climate Leadership Council, which documents America's carbon advantage. We had a great event last November where Katrina Rourke uh, was on a panel with us, and she explained this concept of a carbon advantage. And I'll be uh, asking Dave Banks about that more uh, in just one minute. Uh, but first, let me introduce Dave. Dave Banks is an economist, political analyst, and policy advocate focusing on climate change, energy, and trade. He served as chief strategist for the Republican side of the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. He was also President Donald Trump's Special Assistant for International Energy and Environment at the National Economic and National Security Councils. Republican Deputy Staff Director of the U.S. Senate Environmental and Public Works, Works Committee, Senior Advisor on International Affairs and Climate Change for President George W. Bush, a State Department Foreign Service Officer and CIA Economic Analyst. Dave, thank you so much for being here. Last week, BPC released a new issue brief that you wrote titled, Understanding America's Carbon Advantage and Identifying Strategic Goals for a Bipartisan Approach to U.S. Climate and Trade Policy. And that's exactly what I want to talk with you about today, so we can help set the stage for the discussion we're going to have with Senator Kramer and General McMaster. So what is this carbon advantage? What are the strategic goals we can accomplish by linking climate and trade policy? And, and why is there so much potential for bipartisanship? So let's start with the first thing. What is this carbon advantage? Yeah, thanks, Sam. That's a, that's a great question. Look, um, so basically the United States is more carbon efficient than the world's average. Uh, and a lot more than our geopolitical competitors. Uh, basically, our industry requires less carbon to produce a product than the world average. For example, uh, the average widget made in China requires three times more carbon to make than if it were made here in, in the good old United States. Um, in Russia, India, it's at least four times. And so, and what's made that possible? Because I get this question as well. Well, we've achieved significant success at decarbonization. Over the previous 15 years, we've led the world in reducing carbon emissions by far, I mean, by a long shot, uh, largely because of fuel switching from coal to natural gas, increased deployment of renewables and energy efficiency gains. Now, going back to your, uh, to your uh, uh, 
point with about the Climate Leadership Council, if, if, if folks are really interested in digging into the data, they should certainly check out that report uh, that they published in 2020. And they just launched a Climate and Trade Center. So I'm assuming, but well, I'm expecting that there to be a lot more data come out on this that people can sort of dig into and understand more clearly. So stay tuned for that. Thank you. Yeah, that, and this concept of the carbon advantage that domestically we're able to produce goods with lower carbon intensity uh, and that it creates an opportunity for us. I mean, that's that's really interesting and intriguing. And you know, I can see why there's a, there's a bipartisan interest in, in exploring this concept. So, you know, in your paper, you described five strategic goals of a climate and trade policy. Uh, and I'm gonna read them to you just, just so we're all clear on remembering what they are. One is capturing market supply. Two is improving supply chain security. Three is preventing job leakage. Four is reducing global greenhouse gas emissions. And five is resurrecting US manufacturing. Could you dig in a little bit more on these strategic goals that we can accomplish if we actually do a good job in designing a policy to, to link climate and trade? Yeah, so look, that's, that's why I'm so fascinated with this policy concept. I mean, I love this idea, right? It's really rare that you get one policy that has the potential to solve so many problems at once. And by the way, these are big problems. They're not little ones, right? And so if we create the right policy design, and this is a really important point um, in coordination with our allies and like minded economies and partners, we can recapture global market share that we lost since bringing China into the WTO. Now, in my opinion, that was a big mistake. And this is a chance that we can uh, that, that we can pursue to try to fix some of that. So we're not talking about a policy that simply protects US industry from foreign competition because we've imposed heavy regulation on the economy. Now that's the typical conversation that we have around border carbon adjustment. Now this is, this is much bigger than that. We're going on the offense, right? We're resurrecting US manufacturing by creating a performance-based international market that recognizes US decarbonization and our achievements around that. Now uh, there's the issue of supply chain security. Now this is a big, big problem that we've, that we've all begun to recognize. Uh, and, you know, and how do we fix this? Well, uh, I guess there are a number of ways to do it, but as it pertains to this policy, because the United States and our allies extract and produce resources more cleanly from a GHG perspective, and the same applies to manufactured products, we can bring key components of that supply chain back to our shores. And this is another important point. Now, you, uh, you know, I'm not just saying bring it back to the United States, but bring it back to the United States and our treaty allies, because we're not that we're not that concerned about supply chain issues as, as they pertain to, to Canada or Australia, right? Uh, <clears throat> and of, of all the goods we import, 75% uh, come from less carbon efficient countries. Now, uh, a lot of those, especially China, have essentially created a competitive advantage by having loose environmental compliance and enforcement regimes. So they're subsidizing their industry, right? We don't have free and fair trade with these folks. We need to level that playing field by charging a fee or a tax on their dirtier imports. And then so doing, we can help stop the wealth and job transfer from America to those places. And let me remind folks, these places, these countries are often hostile towards US national interests. And then of course, you know, there's the climate piece. There's the goal of reducing global emissions in a way that's consistent with the science. Now there is no, viable political scenario. I'm sure I might, I might have friends who would disagree with me, but in my opinion, there's no viable political scenario short of a global economic meltdown that will get us there with the current strategies embraced by the United States and most of the developed world. As long as we largely focus our efforts on reducing U.S. territorial emissions, I'm talking about, again, the emissions that just come from the United States, which only accounts for about 10 to 12 percent of global emissions, we're probably going to fail and actually it's not probably, we are going to fail. If we're going to address the growth in emissions in the developing world, and then effectively push China uh, to accept this responsibility as a developed economy, we're going to need to harness the market power of the United States and its allies and pursue this common climate and trade policy, whatever it is that we agree upon. Together we account for 
more than 40% of global imports. Now that's the type of leverage we need. And related to that, and you referenced it earlier, I would recommend that folks take a look at the op-ed in foreign policy published by Senator Kramer and General McMaster last December, because it digs into it a little more. Thank you. And can I just ask you a little bit more about this, this idea of, of imports? Uh, you know, I've, I've heard this problem referred to as the carbon loophole, right? We, we have domestic policies, or maybe Europe has their own domestic policies that, uh, you know, are pro-climate, trying to reduce emissions, uh, but then imports come in that were made not using those same constraints. So it, you know, it's like, you know, importing emissions that, you know, we don't kind of count under our, our uh, metrics for success for ourselves. You know, how, how does, how do, how's the right way to think about that in terms of climate and trade policy? Now, Zan, you're, you're trying to get me to talk about the dirty little secret, right, of, of, of international climate policy and the climate spend that we have, uh, you know, in developed economy capital. So, no, so you just hit the big, big problem, right? And if you look at, if you look at the actual emissions that we're responsible for, and, and what I mean by that, you know, what do we, what do we produce here? But then what's the balance between what we export versus import? There's always gonna be embodied carbon in trade flows, right? But the question is, are we pursuing policies here that make us feel good, right? Uh, but, but are not effective at, at reducing global emissions, in fact, are the opposite, right? That actually result in global emissions because you're offshoring emissions to dirtier economies. So in the case of the United States, <clears throat> if we were going to account for the consumption of emissions um, that we get, including including the balance between export and import of emissions, uh, we're, we're, our emissions are roughly 10% higher than what we report. Now, if you look at Europe, Europe, the, the problem is much, much worse in Europe. If you look at the EU on average, it's 30% higher. If you look at the UK, it's 40%. So if you take those numbers and the, the Europeans use the 1990 baseline, a lot of these economies have not experienced any kind of real meaningful emissions reductions. In fact, some of them have actually grown their emissions since 1990. So this is a big problem that we have to address, closing that carbon loophole, so to speak. And so by, by creating an effective climate and trade policy, we can help close that gap. Thank you. I got one last question for you. We got three minutes left in this segment. And uh, let's get a little political. You know, this is the Bipartisan Policy Center. We focus on climate policies, ideally, that can get bipartisan support and that are going to get us on the path to net zero. Why is this issue so right for bipartisanship? Well, so you know, going back to the, to the strategic goals um, that could be achieved through the right policy design. Look, I mean, I would say that the vast majority of Democrats and Republicans would agree on achieving all of them. They might they might talk about it differently. They might rank them in different order, but we're all there. Um, there were, we're, we're basically all there. And uh, they're obviously part, a lot of this has been uh, as a result of two things. Number one is our shifting position on trade policy, right? There's a growing recognition just across the political spectrum, Democrats and Republicans, that we don't have a free trade regime. We might, we might support free trade with like-minded economies, economies that have similar environment and labor standards, but that's not the current world order, right? Um, so addressing that issue, but then also constructing, constructing a policy uh, that will be more effective at reducing global emissions, I think it, it helps align all the political interests. Of course, the devil's in the details, but I feel really confident that if we pursue smart politics here, and by the way, smart politics here will trump smart policy any day, right? But if we can if we can merge Trump's America First approach with Biden's Made in America agenda, and I know my Democratic friends hate to hear this, but it kind of sounds the same. If you ask if you ask our foreign partners out there, they're like, this kind of sounds the same, Dave. And I'm like, well, there's a lot of commonality here that if we play it the right way, we can construct a long-lasting foreign trade and climate policy that survives these crazy political shifts in Washington. That's the holy grail, right? establishing a national consensus on major climate mitigation, on a, on, a, on a major strategy that places the United States in a reliable global leadership role. And I think this is it. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Um, 
So we are now going to move over to our panel of our next two speakers, uh, is General McMaster and Senator Kevin Kramer. I'm going to introduce them in just a minute, um, but I'm going to remind everyone what I, what I said earlier. They published a, a very fascinating op-ed in foreign policy uh, just a few months ago, uh, and it was, it was about thinking about this climate trade issue in terms of geopolitics, and, and particularly in terms of, of countering Putin. So I'm gonna read some, some quick introductions here. I think uh, Senator Kramer might be a minute or two late because he was called to the floor for votes. Uh, so we might just start with uh, General McMaster, but we'll see, we'll see if he's able to, to come back online by the time I finish reading introductions. All right, General H.R. McMaster is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. He is also a fellow at the Friedman Spogli Institute and lecturer at Stanford University's Graduate School of Business. He serves as the Japan Chair at the Hudson Institute and Chairman of the Center for Political and Military Power at the Foundation for Defense of Democracy. He was the 26th Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs. McMaster served as a commissioned officer in the United States Army for 34 years after graduation from West Point. He holds a PhD in Military History from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So, General, thank you for being here. I'll, I'll hold off on Senator Kramer's uh, introduction until he until he pops on. But I'd like to just start with a question for you, and I'm actually going to ask Senator Kramer the same question when, when he comes on. And that's, you know, right now I think everyone is is paying a lot of attention to what's going on in Ukraine. In your op-ed, you talk about developing a common climate and trade policy with the EU, specifically to reduce Russian energy dominance in Europe. Can you explain why reducing Russia's influence in European energy markets is particularly important and, and how a climate and trade policy can accomplish that objective? Hey, Zan. Well, thanks, thanks for having me. And thanks for what the Bipartisan Policy Center is doing. I mean, as Dave said, we need some bipartisan policy because we need consistency in our policy. And, you know, I think there's a heck of a lot we can agree on. And one of the things we can agree on is, hey, it's, it's bad if, if Russia has coercive power over Europe, Europe's economy. And we're seeing it play out right now. We ought to th send a thank you note uh, <laughs> to uh, Senator Kramer and I, to, to Vladimir Putin for highlighting the importance of our, our policy proposal. And, and, uh, and, and so what you, have, what you see is, is Germany being reluctant to stand up to Putin because Putin has cultivated this dependence, right? What, what Putin does is he disrupts. He disrupts with, you know, with cyber-enabled information warfare. He disrupts with you know, he disrupts with, uh, with with massive troops on Ukraine's border using unconventional forces under cover of conventional forces like the annexation of Crimea and the invasion of Ukraine in 2014. And, and, and then, you know, of course, he he uh, he, he denies you know, even the most brazen action and gets away with it a lot of times because of dependence, the three D's. Right. And the third D being dependence. You know, uh, Germany made some big mistakes you know, they made some big mistakes. They you know, they canceled nuclear power. Uh, they said they're going to bridge immediately into, into, into renewables, put no bridging strategy away from coal in, into place. They increased their dependence, therefore, on Russia. About 50 percent of their gas and 40 percent of their oil comes, comes from Russia. Uh, and you know the controversy around, around Nord Stream 2, Nord Stream which would give Russia even more coercive of power uh, over Germany. And so it's really important for energy supply chains to be dependable and to be resilient. And we can do it. The problem is there are too many, as Dave alluded to, non-solutions masquerading as solutions. And, and Zan, what happens is not enough people, I think, are looking at the overall interconnected problem set. So they're looking at reduction of carbon emissions separate from, the, from environmental issues, separate from energy security issues and the need to continue economic growth, to like, lift people out of poverty. And, and these non-solutions won't work for a number of reasons. First of all, we know there's no single state solution. There's no just developed economy solution. It has to be a global solution, a world solution, um, because it's really the, the emissions that are killing us right now are, you know, are from China and from India and developing economies in, in Africa and elsewhere. And so we need economically viable solutions. And what Senator, you know, what Senator Kramer and I put forward is a way to incentivize, incentivize the clean production of natural gas and, and export of natural gas and delivery of natural gas as the bridge away from coal, which is the biggest immediate problem in the energy sector associated with man-made CO2, 
uh, and, and into into renewables and 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 and, uh, and a sustainable approach, including you know nuclear power. It's got to be a big part of that. You see that debate going on in the EU. So I, the the bottom line is, hey, let's not talk about non solutions anymore. We all know the the, the, the reality. If everybody's driving an electric car, <laughs> and we have charging stations all over the country, but or all over China, but but the electricity that's going into those cars is coming from coal fired plants. That's no good. And I think people would probably be surprised. I mean, U.S. coal imports are way up. Everybody's burning more coal from Germany to Japan to China because because of the of the fragility uh, in in in, uh, in in energy supply chains. And so we have a lot of work to do. And you know what's sad? I, I think Sam, we're on a path to become Germany. You know what's happening in Germany right now? Gas prices are so high right now in in, in Germany that some German steel and aluminum plants are selling their energy allocations and shutting their plants down, you know, because it's more economically viable for them to do that than to cope with the supply constraints and the associated rise in prices. So, hey, I hope this is a wake up for us. But, you know, how it ever made sense from a geostrategic perspective to cancel a Canadian pipeline and green light a Russian one. I mean, how does that make any sense? And I think it's important for us to realize that we've actually imported more oil from Russia ourselves in the midst of this crisis into Massachusetts because we've canceled pipelines that could have that could have given us uh, reliable delivery of energy to 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 into our own, into our own territories across our own territory. So, lots of work to do. Uh, I think the bottom line is we have to look at the pro the program problem set holistically, and not sub optimize. And as Dave said, you know. Uh, who's done so much great work on this over the years. You know, why don't we just start conversations? And this is consistent with the philosophy of, of the Bipartisan Policy Center with what we can agree on, right? H how about, you know, how about that uh, global warming's bad, right? It's man-made, it's associated with carbon emissions, and we can do something about it. If we just start with that, uh, we, we can come up with solutions like the, those that that, uh, that that Senator Kramer and I have, have proposed. And um, and so I, so I think it's generating some good debate and I, and, and but really what we need to do is generate some action, and I see I see the good senator arriving here. Thank you, General. As uh, that was as a little the, bit of a filibuster in my in, in, that I was engaged in to, to buy some time for you, Senator, to join. Congra us. Congratulations, you're not qualified to be one of us. <laughs> you guys, you guys trading jobs in the middle of this? Here? What's going on? Hey, listen, if I thought I could be qualified for his, I I would trade. <laughs> Thank you so much, General, and uh, thank you for being here, Senator. I'm going to do a quick introduction of you, and then I'm just going to launch mm -hmm. right into asking you a question, if that's all right. Okay, absolutely. Glad to. So, Senator Kevin Kramer was elected to the U.S. Senate uh, on November 6, 2018, after serving three terms as North Dakota's at-large member of the U.S. House of Representatives. He's the first Republican to hold the Senate seat in his lifetime. He serves on the Armed Services, Environment and Public Works, Veterans Affairs, Banking, uh, banking, housing, and urban affairs, and budget committees. Thank you, Senator, for, for being here. And the, the question I'd like to, to start off with um, is that I think everyone is, is paying a lot of attention right now to Russia and Ukraine mm -hmm. for, for obvious reasons. Yeah. And you know, in the op-ed that you re recently released in, in foreign policy, you talked about developing a climate and trade policy with the EU to reduce Russian energy dominance in Europe. Can you explain why that is so important and uh, how linking our climate and trade policies could achieve that objective? Well, thanks for the question. There are, I think, lots of reasons for it that are maybe fairly obvious. Um, this is actually, actually, um, Russia's energy dominance is something that's intrigued me for a long time. Um, obviously, coming from an oil producing state, North Dakota, with over a million barrels per day. Uh, uh, at our peak, about a million and a half barrels per day of production, number two in the in the state. The only thing that prevents us from doing more is access to global markets. And when we were able to, as you might recall, lift the export ban um, as part of an omnibus spending bill with uh, with President Obama and uh, and and Speaker Ryan, um, that opened up a lot of things. And one of the things that it opened up, one of the things that it demonstrated, with our ability our ability being the United States ability to export crude oil, we became a price leader instead of a price follower. And you saw what we expected we would see the WTI 
and, and, and rent sort of flatten out a little bit, come a little closer together. That's because of our, our increased, obviously, influence into the market, providing um, more options. So right, off, right out of the shoot, there's an economic, global economic advantage. Um, but by, by you know, looking at the Ukraine-Russia situation, which is the lens we're looking through now, it really highlights the, the, uh, my axiom that I've always believed, and that is um, energy security is national security. It's economic security as well as, as fundamental national security. And obviously, Vladimir Putin's um, having, having much of Europe captive to his you know, soul supply, if you will, particularly of natural gas, but, but you know, to, to a, a lesser degree, but still to a degree, even electricity, at least as it relates to Ukraine, um, you know, that, that's a lever. I've often said I'd rather use the peaceful tools of energy development than the weapons of war. And, and I think that's what this demonstrates. Have, we, never like a, we never like a monopoly. Monopolies always lead to higher prices. It leads, leads to captive uh, markets and captive suppliers. Um, and uh, I, I think it has, so I think it, obviously it has the advantage of neutralizing Russia's influence with the transatlantic partnership. It's so important. That coalition is obviously so important for lots of reasons. The other thing though that it does is that it, um, it helps, it helps uh, competition helps bring down price. So wh whether it's keeping everything as is, plus adding in uh, American and, and other sources of energy into, a, into an alliance, into a trade pact of some sort, it has the advantage of bringing down price because of competition, because of, you know, obviously choices, alternatives. But the other thing is this, and it's really important, I think, and that is many places, including the Middle East and including the United States, produce the same products in a cleaner fashion. And if reducing global emissions is a, is a goal, and I think it is a goal for people on, on you know, participating in this, it is for me, uh, it certainly is for the vast majority of Americans, then um, we, ought to be, we ought to be viewing, if we're gonna view climate change through a global lens, and we ought to, then we ought to also view the solutions through a global lens. And I think in that sort of a scenario, the United States does very, very well, as does the, as does the Earth. Thank you, Senator. You both touched on uh, two points that I really just want to highlight because I, I think that you're, you're spot on. One is that when we're thinking about emissions, it's, it's a global problem and we have to think globally. And that's, that, that's clear in, in how the climate models work. It's, science is clear on that. Um, and it's clear that our policies should, should reflect that, that issue. And the other point that you both touched on, which I think is important both domestically and in the context of Russian dominance in, in energy markets in Europe is, is the importance of energy reliability and security and affordability. You know, when we're thinking about, you know, energy prices here in America, whatever our climate solution is going to be, it needs to take into account that our families, our businesses need access to secure, reliable, affordable energy. Um, and so, you know, Senator Kramer, I, I think, when you released uh, that, that op-ed, there was a bit of a stir, at least in my world. Um, people were, were, you know, their, their ears perked up, their eyes opened wide, and they, you know, you're, you're a, a Republican senator, you're a conservative Republican senator, you're a conservative Republican senator from North Dakota, which is, I, if, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, that's the, the second largest uh, oil producing state, second only to, to Texas. And here you are with, a, with an op-ed about climate policy. And it's about linking climate policy and, and trade yeah. policy, but but your argument is is actually that this climate and trade policy uh, is is about markets for for U.S. oil and gas. Could, could you just explain that a bit more? Sure. No, it's great. It's a great observation. And this is why, first of all, this is why I appreciate this forum because I think one of the things that keeps conservative, mean spirited, right wing, oligarch Republicans, free market capitalists from talking about this stuff is that they don't want to explain it because explaining it's difficult. But I think in, in what General McMaster and I wrote about in the op-ed, I think it's fairly simple to explain, but we still need the forms to explain it in. And, 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 it's, and it's, it's this, that we have not, not only do we have nothing to fear from a, a global, geopolitical solution, we have everything to gain from it. It strengthens our alliances with our already natural allies, particularly our European allies. It, it, it meets their objectives of 
uh, you know, lowering emissions and finding solutions. I, and, and I think it, it increases our influence in the world and lots of other things as well. When you're at the table, preferably at the head of the table, that everybody else is sitting around, you have, you, this, is a, this is a global opportunity to lead from a position of strength rather than sort of ignore it or, 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 uh, or worse yet, just shrink from it. So I, I think that that's that, you know that's a big part of it. On the other hand, North Dakota is also a big coal producing state. We, we generate most of our electricity with coal. We do it at the mine mouth. And and here's the other thing: if there's going to be an innovation solution, and by that I mean, you know, cleaner coal, carbon capture, utilization, storage, nuclear advancements, uh, as well as more efficient wind, um, you know better grid systems, better efficiency, all, all of these things, we're going to come up with those solutions as likely as any other state, as any other country. Um, and, and that becomes an additional advantage to our intellectual capabilities, to our value chain uh, capabilities. Um, and then suddenly the, the innovations that help you know, find the solutions become another tradable you know, uh, a product. And so Again, I just I just prefer to lead from the head of the table rather than the back of the room. Thank you. Uh, so for, for the audience, we will we will uh, in a few minutes be turning to some audience questions. So if you have questions, please uh, put them in the chat in YouTube or in Facebook, uh, or if you're uh, watching on Twitter, you can use the hashtag BPC Live. Um, I've got a few more questions, and then we're gonna we're gonna turn to that section section of the uh, the conversation here, General McMaster. You were National Security Advisor to President Trump. Um, you know how difficult negotiating a trade deal is. Um, do you think this sort of proposal will find uh, a friendly ear in Europe to, to actually come up with a trade deal that, that works for both the United States and uh, in Europe? You know, I don't know, but I think the chances are going way up. Uh, <laughs> thanks to, as I mentioned earlier, Vladimir Putin. And him, him demonstrating that you know the the downside of him having coercive power uh, over Germany and, and other economies, and you've seen the debate in the European Union Parliament also about designating natural gas at least you know at, at least temporarily you know as a, as a as a green fuel in recognition that the largest reduction ever ever of man made carbon emissions what, what was associated with the with the availability of cheap natural gas in the United States, right? It was a market solution. It wasn't some big plan in Washington, right? So I think there's a recognition that, hey, it's time for real solutions, no more non-solutions. You see this also with the European Union designating, uh, maybe designating, we'll see, nuclear as, 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 a green, as a green source of energy as well. And look at France's now uh, strategy and the investments they're putting into it. And, you know, we're losing that competition as well, the, the nuclear competition. And of course, you see who's stepping into that? China, Russia. And when, 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 they, when they have get contracts internationally, guess what? That's a long-term economic relationship that, as we're discussing, translates into geopolitical and geostrategic influence. So all this is, is interconnected. And you know what? If you're not on the field of play, you're going to get your ass kicked. So I think it's really important for the United States to have policies in place that allow us to get on the field and to play. And Senator Kramer, Kramer mentioned uh, some, some of the actions we've taken in recent years. Hey, it's time to do more. It's time to increase our ability to compete effectively. And, and by the way, do the right thing for the whole world in terms of you know, cleaner sources of energy, more reliable sources of energy, so we can get at this interconnected problem set of climate and environment and energy security. And of course, as we're seeing, national and international security as well. Yeah, if I could um, take on to that a little bit. First of all, the general makes a great point. Vladimir Putin is the greatest un un uniter uh, in recent history. And, um, and he's you know, helping make the, the point, as the general said. You, you know, last week, well, what, just over the course of the last few weeks, I'm sure a lot of you have noticed if you've paid much attention that a lot of European leaders are coming into the United States. I, I've had the, the privilege of meeting with a lot of them ambassadors, energy ministers, uh, national security advisors. Um, and uh, one of them that, that came by, uh, called specifically to come by was um, Kadri uh, uh, Simpson, the European Union Energy um, Commissioner. And I learned a lot listening to her and, and talking to her. And what I found is a much more of an openness 
to consider alternative um, sources of natural gas, partic particularly uh, LNG. Now, we know there's a lot of challenges. We have challenges on our end of being able to provide it. Th these are midterm and long-term probably solutions, but they are seeing and I think welcoming the opportunity. One of the things I did not know, and I thought I knew quite a bit about this, was that they still have about a third of the the, the uh, um, nameplate capacity of their import terminals uh, available for receiving natural gas. Now, there are other infrastructure challenges that have to be met, but we can meet those. We all know, you know, I've known for a decade or longer that Spain has a lot of import terminals, but they have a mountain range, and that becomes a problem. But those are all solvable problems. Um, and so I've taken a little heat um, from some of my free market friends, particularly those from the, the previous administration that, that worked really hard to deal with Europe and found it very difficult. I would submit to you that the climate is different. And particularly if we can, you know, maybe keep it to this topic, um, uh, as much as I'd love to sell more, um, you know, genetically modified crops, um, if we can keep it to this one topic that is top of the mind for everybody and has such a direct correlation to national security, yeah, I, I, we'd be, I think we'd be um, negligent in not trying. Hey, I just, I just want to mention one other thing, the way this is, is related to geopolitics. Hey, anything that we're trying to do in this connection, right, to increase U.S. exports, to reduce dependence and reduce Russian influence and coercive power over Europe, guess who's going to oppose that? Russia. And one of the ways they're going to do that is with all sorts of malign influence and disinformation, allying oftentimes, or, you know, surreptitiously oftentimes, uh, with with green movements and environmental groups. Right. This is what this is how you know how Russia helped to generate a lot of opposition uh, to to shale and to and to uh, uh, and, and to fracking with, within Europe. So we just have to recognize there are multi, multiple dimensions of this competition in connection with U.S. policy, EU policy. Uh, and, and also on the battleground of perception and information as well. Thank you. Um, Senator Kramer, a, a question for you. You know, we all know that policy theoretically can, can work all sorts of ways, but at the end yeah. of the day, you have to actually agree on a policy design. Um, you know, for, for years, people thought about this border carbon adjustment as as, as a piece of a policy around a domestic price on carbon, whether that's cap and trade or carbon tax. Uh, I think only, only recently have people started thinking about it as its own policy, absent a, a price on carbon. What do you think about that? Do you, do you think this policy requires a price on carbon or do you think it can exist on its own? Well, I, thanks for that question because I believe it can exist on its own. Now, there, there's been some discussion, some debate, I think some presumptions that aren't accurate that uh, you know some people have said well it's not compliant with trade policy or wto if there's not a domestic price we have found that you know i think largely to not be true at all i i think that um in fact i think the simpler you make it the better because you can you know if, if it's a standard that if you meet it there's nothing and if you don't you know there's a there, there's a there's a, a tariff um one of the things that donald trump taught even us um you know us conservatives as free marketers, is that that America first is both popular and and effective, and it's it's important to the to the United States' own security, and so I I think a geopolitical alliance like this d d should not require a carbon price. I don't talk about a carbon price. In fact, I frankly I run from it as soon as somebody brings it up, even if it's a swell idea. I believe that increments are the way you get things done. This is one increment that I think in and of itself will make a big difference. And, uh, and if that's all we do, we've made a big difference. If, if you know, with the evolution of things, uh, policy and, and thought, um, you know, something else emerges, uh, we'll take a look at it at that time. But I think for right now, we have an idea that, is, that can be popular, easily explained, it fits into the, the shifting populism of our country while recognizing our alliances and our adversaries. Uh, it, it, to me, it has all of the right, the, all the makings all the, uh, of a good recipe for, for success. All right, we're going to turn to, to audience Q&A and we're, we're going to bring back Dave Banks to, to field some of these questions as well. Uh, the, the first question we have here is from, from Brett. And it's, it's, you know, what's the path forward? Is, is this something to talk about at the next COP? Is this something that is gonna happen in the US Congress? What, what, what should we be looking for in terms of next steps in actually advancing this policy? 
Well, um, I'll, I'll take a first whack at that. Um, I, it, it certainly would, could and sh maybe should be a discussion at the next COP. But between now and then, I, I think some of it's happening. Some of it's happening as a result of what's taking place in Ukraine. Back to sort of the, you know, sort of the moment here, um, because it's highlighting the vulnerability of, of captivity to one source, or at least you know, you know, largely one source of energy for our allies. So I think now is now is a great time to be talking about forwarding it. That's why I bring it up to every foreign leader I can talk to. That's that where it's relevant. Um, I also bring it up with my colleagues because they kind of need to be softened, you know, to, to your previous point at the beginning. And um, so, to, and then doing forums like this, and I, I would look for more opportunities and more forums like this to discuss it in. And uh, I think, I mean, I, don't, I hate to, well, let me just say it. I, I think this is a safe place. I really do. And, I, and, I, and when I say a safe place, I mean, I think this is a policy that provides a landing pad for the first step or at least the next step for perhaps bigger things but um so i just think we have to keep the conversation going we have to be deliberate about it but also opportunistic when when the policy when the, the opportunity presents itself and more and more it's presenting itself obviously this the result of what, when we get done here and why go back and vote again because we were i mean i won't even tell you about the voting schedule but anyway when i, when I leave here and go vote again i i can almost guarantee there'll be a, an energy reporter that asks me about this conversation every one of those are opportunities to to forward the discussion um you know you guys i've stopped i shouldn't say this. i i've basically stopped doing political news um uh, stations anymore. I, I like the business stations. I like the business networks, CNBC. I'm, I think I'm doing Squawk Box tomorrow, in fact. So CNBC, Bloomberg TV, uh, Fox Business, because you get to have these more substantive policy discussions. And again, just keep softening um, you know, our audience, our base, with an America first energy policy, which is something we, we say we love. Thank you. I'm going to I'm going to bring Dave in for a second and, and kind of build on that. You know, we, we had an event last November with uh, Congressman Scott Peters, Democrat, about a, a bill he introduced with Senator Chris Coons, also Democrat. Here we have Senator uh, Kevin Kramer, who's a Republican. We, we've got people on both sides of the aisle talking about this border carbon adjustment. Like, What do you think are the chances that we can actually build on this beginnings of of a, of a policy that already has some bipartisan legs? No, look, I mean, I think we can. I think we just need to focus at the at the high level concept, right? And the objectives that we want to achieve, mm -hmm. right? And then sit down and kind of figure out, well, what's the best policy design that will achieve those objectives? I will sort of add to uh, to, to what the Senator said uh, about, the, about the, the next steps and sort of pulling this together internationally. Look, I mean, I think we should focus on a smaller group of like-minded economies working through the G7. Um, there's no one, at least in my, you know, in my space, who's suggesting that we could get some kind of WTO agreement. In fact, we don't care about the WTO, to be honest. Um, you know, we do. We're, you know, we're focused on just kind of building uh, again an America First climate and trade strategy that helps correct for the mistakes of the past and promotes U.S geopolitical interest. And then I think I'll, I will maybe conclude with with General McMaster. You know, we, we've talked about this a lot of times. Um, the moment for this discussion is is ripe with everything going on with Russia and Ukraine. You know, when people are, are thinking about the, the national security implications, the geopolitical implications, what what are the big takeaways that that they should be drawing from the situation in Russia right now for the climate and trade conversation? Well, we've seen that Russia uses energy supplies for course of purposes. We should learn vicariously through the experience of Germany. We should learn vicariously through the experience of Japan. We have to recognize, hey, we, we, as we, as we, if we try to just leap to renewables right now, what we will do is we will create dependencies mainly on China and supply chains associated with rare earths and battery manufacturing and solar panel manufacturing and turbine manufacturing that is reminiscent of our energy dependence on the Middle East in the 1970s. Why would we want to do that? So I think what we need, again, 
is real solutions, no more non-solutions, and in particular to pay attention to this nexus of national security and energy security. You know, if I could just back that up a little bit um, in terms of the timing question and, and Chris Coons, when he, you can only, you can only imagine when he read the op-ed, you know how, how kind of excited he was to say, "Hey, I, there might be a you know Republican in my in my sandbox here." And so he and I talked a little bit. Now we, we've been distracted by a lot of other things, but those other things actually, uh, well, at that time it was BBB and a whole bunch of nonsense. Now, and in fact, I just got asked about it today by an energy or an environmental reporter about, you know, BBB gets all this attention, it's dead, but there's talk of a climate, you bring, re, bring, bring up the climate piece of it again, all that, to which I say all the time, look, I don't care if you call it BBB climate, I don't care if you call it a climate plan, I don't care what you call it, I call it an America first energy opportunity. I think with, with Joe Manchin and, and sort of where he hangs out, and of course, he's got so much leverage, we had to we had to look at a plan that includes that includes this and if, if it can if it can translate into some legislation where there's other where there are other areas where we agree you guys there are areas where we agree and i'd rather have an incremental success story than an aspirational goal that we, we never get started on so i you know i i'm encouraged by what what david said too i think there is a moment here to have some bipartisan discussions with people who are serious thinkers about a solution as opposed to um you know uh you know a, a fuel source let's let's focus on let's focus on the uh, a, an emissions goal let's look at solutions get together and uh obviously a little compromise but i think there's a lot more common ground than people might think if we just you know sit down and talk about it and i just think this is this is the lowest hanging fruit frankly well, actually having some potential for some bipartisan progress on climate policy is music to my ears and music to ours here at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Thank you so much for this fascinating conversation. Uh, thank you, General. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Dave. Um, to the audience, we'll be continuing to work on this issue, um, and we hope to see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you.